people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. 26th Conference of the Parties or COP26 which concluded recently in Glasgow has revisited the Paris pledges of 2015. However, not without drama and controversy. While the phrase phase down instead of phase out in the final draft regarding the cutting down on coal emissions triggered a bad press for the developing countries, the leaders and experts in these nations, including those in India and Bangladesh, have outrightly called out the hypocrisy of developed nations, who they say have not obliged in assisting the former in order to meet the climate changes. Coal, a fossil fuel that is responsible for 40% of CO2 emission globally, was discussed for the first time in the 26th session of Conference of the Parties in Glasgow. This was also the unprecedented conference where countries came together to pledge net zero emission, an initiative to cut down fossil fuel usage and move towards technology-driven clean energy in coming years. Major calls were also taken on deforestation, methane emission and financing of poor countries that cannot meet the commitments with resources they have. However, the questions that have been raised by several observers and experts from developing countries are more than just pertinent. While many say it was merely a PR exercise that might not materialize its aim of capping global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius, Others refer to it as a calibrated effort to prevent developing nations reaching where the developed have already reached. A New Delhi-based environmentalist Vimlendu Jha opines that India should have never signed the charter for it will prevent it from growth. It is important to address the issue of coal locally as well and globally. Uh, the last minute drama indeed was about uh, what about equity how developing nations actually have a right uh, to develop as in, you know we cannot really sign up to net zero so immediately or or make such huge climate commitments where there's right to grow or right to life which is as paramount in a country like india where there is the energy deficit per capita energy consumption of most indians is very very less Developing countries argue that rich nations whose historical emissions are largely responsible for warming the planet must finance their efforts both to transition away from fossil fuels and to adapt to increasingly severe climate impacts. The deal offered a promise to double adaptation finance by 2025 from 2019 but no guarantees have been given. Earlier, the developed countries had committed to finance the developing nations with $100 billion every year in order to make the efficient transition. They haven't delivered on that promise. A UN committee will report next year on progress towards the same and the finance will then be discussed again in 2024 and 2026. Bangladesh has called the conference a massive failure where countries like it were not given any solution and instead were burdened with fancy propositions. We'll bring it up again. We're not giving up, but we are describing this COP as an abject failure because it hasn't been able to rise to the occasion of dealing with loss and damage. It doesn't matter what else they do. That was our issue. The poor countries, the vulnerable countries came here for that and they've been slapped in the face by the president. While COP26 was an opportunity where the pledges made under the Paris Climate Agreement could have been given a feasible blueprint for coming years, it has not been accepted on expected lines. The goal is to keep cutting emissions until they reach net zero by mid-century, but the developed countries that established themselves on the very same principles want other fastest-growing developing economies to be denied that privilege. 
a case study could be India, whose primary energy source is coal, but the per capita consumption is far below other countries. How can it be asked to control its emissions when the developed world has failed in meeting its commitments? Same goes for Bangladesh, one of the fastest growing economies after India. Leaders might have compulsions to fall in line with the international agendas, but the experts and people have clearly called the COP26 a failure, a massive failure. For now, just wait for the next year's COP27 summit in Egypt where these objections might receive some traction and more importantly, the action. Moving on, Kashmiris have come down heavily on the government of Pakistan which organized a paid OIC delegation visit in Pakistan occupied Kashmir a few days ago. In a bid to paint a contrasting picture to the reality, Islamabad, which has been desperately trying to expand its influence in the organization of the Islamic cooperation, a 57-member grouping hosted six persons. While it prepared their itinerary as per its own convenience, experts have targeted the OIC and have asked pointed questions if they were able to notice the discrimination, brute violation of fundamental rights and the abject poverty which the people of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir were being subjected to on an everyday basis. A Kashmiri political activist has lambasted the visit of a delegation of organization of the Islamic cooperation to Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Dr. Amjad Ayub Mirza alleged that OIC was stoking up the Kashmir issue at the behest of Islamabad to advance the Pakistani narrative. The OIC delegation travelled a few places in POK as per the itinerary prepared by Pakistan. They held symbolic meetings with the local leaders and parroted Islamabad's position in the region. They went to the extent of praising Pakistan for its work while ignoring the fact that there were multiple protests being held at the same time in the region. From students to traders to government officials to the common citizens, all have been holding anti-Pakistan government protests for weeks. Mirza, while exposing the real intent behind this funded tour, posed a number of uncomfortable questions in front of OIC, asking, if they had seen the true picture of POK, where the current situation is no short of a humanitarian crisis. Did you notice the amount of garbage and filth that is piled up in our cities? Did you manage to interview our shopkeepers who are losing their business every day due to severe load shedding and power failures? Did you manage to visit the family of Dr. Ghulam Abbas, a Canadian Kashmiri who was visiting his city of Kotli to attend his father's funeral and was shot in the face after two weeks only by the Pakistani secret services just because he was promoting Hindu and Muslim interfaith tolerance in our state? Did you visit my rivers that have been dried up because they have been diverted in order to facilitate the hydropower projects that are under construction or, or are being already completed in my land in Pakistani occupied Jammu Kashmir just because Punjab industries and Punjab's factories in Pakistan need to be facilitated with extra power generation. Pakistan holds considerable sway in OIC thanks to its recently formed alliance with Turkey and after failing to muster international support on its Kashmir position on the basis of the repeated perpetuation of lies and propaganda on Kashmir, it has turned to the Islamic grouping. For over seven decades, a significant portion of Kashmir along with Gilgit Baltistan has been under its illegal occupation and despite people's opposition, it has used all legislative and military tools to bring Kashmir's land and resources under its jurisdiction. Mirza also asked as to what was the real driving force for which OIC rallied behind Pakistan's stand and completely ignored native flights. Did you not 
see the misery of my people? Did you not see how we, are, we have been chained in the shackles of an interim constitution prepared, made and imposed by Pakistan on us? That deprives us, that deprives, deprives us of the freedom to choose and forces us to sign a document of uh, accession to Pakistan? Probably not. Probably not. Because like the rest of the world, the rest of the Islamic world, your ears are also being plugged with the Pakistan's false narrative about history and distorted facts about Kashmir. After the British India partition, Pakistan launched a tribal attack on the people of Kashmir and invaded a large portion before the Indian military intervened. And despite the then princely ruler of the state acceding to India, it never withdrew its forces from the region. Resolution 39 of the United Nations clearly states that Pakistan was the aggressor in 1947 and it was urged to withdraw its forces. Unfortunately, the resolution was never paid any sincere regard by Pakistani authorities. Even today, the people of POK and Gilgit Baltistan continue to suffer at the hands of the brutal military rulers of Pakistan. All human rights indices fail to meet even the basic standard with people regularly raising demands for their rights. And the sole reason behind Pakistan hosting free trips for delegations like the one of OIC is that it wants to serve and feed them with lies on Kashmir and the humanitarian status of its people. <laughs> Moving on, the Sri Lankan economic crisis has grown deeper and the island nation is staring even worse with Colombo shutting operations of its only oil refinery for the next 50 days. The government calls it a part of the measures being taken to manage the dwindling forex reserves. Sri Lankan economy is primarily dependent on the tourism industry which has been massively hit by the pandemic and now the government has been seeking foreign assistance in bailing it out. After a $3.6 billion support from Oman last month, Sri Lanka has now turned to its neighboring ally India for a $500 million loan in order to keep its fuel supply running. Long queues at petrol stations emerged as soon as the government of Sri Lanka declared this week that the country's only oil refinery was going to be locked for nearly two months. While some turned up in panic, others looked at it as a signal of an impending spike in petrol prices in the coming weeks. People at the lower strata of the society blame the government for the crisis and accuse that the Rajapaksa duo has failed at managing the crisis in the country. And it is not just about the petrol, but people have been struggling with shortages of multiple essential items including cement, milk powder, rice and cooking gas over the last few weeks. While the list of reasons responsible for the current crisis in Sri Lanka is long, which also include policy paralysis in Colombo, many experts have narrowed it down to two prime factors. One, the pandemic that battered the country's top revenue generating sector and two, a sharp rise in the international crude oil prices. The hike in the global oil prices has forced Sri Lanka to spend more on oil imports this year. The country's oil bill has jumped 41.5% to $2 billion in the first seven months of this year compared to last year. 
The government, however, has ruled out a price revision for the time being and has blamed the opposition for spreading rumors on fuel shortage. As I warned on 29th September at a media briefing, we have decided to temporarily close down the uh, Sapokaskan oil refinery because of the shortage in the foreign currency in the country. So we have to maximally utilize the limited foreign, foreign currency reserves for importation of the essential goods. The country's gross domestic product contracted by a record 3.6% in 2020 and its foreign exchange reserves plunged by half in one year to just $2.8 billion in July. This has led to a 9% depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee against the dollar over the last year, making imports more expensive. It is now looking at its partners to bail it out in the crisis. It has sought $500 million support from India in order to have an uninterrupted fuel supply. It is not just a pandemic. But Sri Lanka has been hit with a number of issues that it has to set in order before moving forward. A ban on the import of fertilizers has also resulted in a sudden spike in food inflation against which the farmers are on the streets for weeks. Experts predict the Rajapaksa government is set to face its most challenging times in the next few months treading and overcoming which is going to be nothing short of an uphill task. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Iranians are racing to exchange the country's currency, the real, in Tehran weeks before nuclear talks with world powers is scheduled to restart. The real declined another 2.8% in the past week, bringing the losses in the past six months to 31.5%. Iran's economy has suffered from sanctions reimposed after the American exit from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action during the former US President Donald Trump's administration. Markets in Tehran are full, but vendors raised concerns over the direction of the currency rates. Vendors say it has a lot of negative effects. They say the prices will rise further if the exchange rates rise. They also say that all their progress will doom. Talks on reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal are set to resume on November 29. Japanese company Idemitsu Kosan has come up with a new business model where it is utilizing the existing 6,300 gas stations in Japan. It is called Smart Eurozua, which means one-stop shop and service. At gas station of Shizuoka Prefecture, a facility of brain MRI service is being provided. The purpose of this service at the station is preventing medical emergency, which will contribute in keeping good health of the people. The brain MRI is conducted by a surgeon using a remote medical treatment system. Applicants can get the report in a week online. If any abnormality is detected, it is to be treated at a regional medical clinic. Gas stations are within the reach of local residents and Idemitsu Kosan recognized this fact and used it to develop their new business model. Japanese companies have been giving immense stress on technological innovations. Recently, Furukawa Electric Company has developed a unique service that contributes to infrastructure development using the location information and video of the drive recorder. Drive recorder is owned by most of the car users. Japanese traffic system and various facilities on the road were constructed from the 1950 to 1970. It was an economically high growth period. Around 50 years ago, 
they were eased and some of them have the possibility of accident or collapse. Furukawa Electric provides a detecting system of aging for the municipal government and manager of road conditions. え、Detailed information about the aging materials is provided by inspectors. The information obtained is managed as data. A support tool for efficient on-site inspection work is just a tablet device. It also simplifies the editing of inspection charts by automatic sorting of the captured image. Furukawa Electric's original digital transformation technology and human know-how integration service Michiten contributes to keeping safe and sustainable traffic conditions. Moving on. The definition of India is incomplete unless one dives into its cultural diversity. A composite society with contrasting traditions, majestic places of worship and festivals. Religious processions have been an inherent part of country's cultural landscape, especially the Hindu religion. Recently, a 10-day Alpasi festival at Sri Padmanabha Swami, the richest temple of India in southern Kerala state, concluded with biannual colourful procession Aratu, where priests paraded the idols of Hindu god Vishnu from the royal palace of Travancore to the temple. The vibrant Aratu procession witnessed a massive people participation in the biannual parade that was carried out around the country's richest temple, Sri Padmanabha Swami in India's southern state of Kerala's capital, Thiruvananthapuram. Priest carried the idol of Hindu Lord Vishnu from the royal palace of Travancore to the temple, meeting the devotees from across the country and abroad along the journey. The primary attraction of the Aratu procession is the holy bath given to deity at Shangumugham beach. The Aratu procession marks the end of Alpasi festival that begins from the temple and continues till the royal palace of King of Travancore, Marthand, near Shangumugham beach. This procession is done uh, twice a year and uh, the, the procession is meant for uh, bhaktas who cannot go to the uh, temples uh, and also it is not only for uh, man but also for the trees and uh, other uh, animals also not only for tr animals it is for trees also because the trees also are bhaktas as per the hindu philosophy and so uh, bhagwan goes to the sea to take a bath the procession starts from the temple with the head of the Travancore royal family leading the procession with sword in hand. One gets to see caparis and elephants as thousands of faithful devotees flock the streets to view this unique and historic site. I have heard about it uh, a lot from my in-laws and uh, this is Salpashri festival and uh, I heard that it is done twice a year. So as you can see, it is beautifully decorated and uh, people are eagerly waiting to see it. It is believed the tradition for the devotees to parade the gods across the city encapsulates the belief of deity witnessing the problems and grievances of their subjects. The Aratu procession makes the event more unique and marks it as one of the most significant festivals across southern India. The uniqueness of the Aratu at Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple is that the head of the royal family of the erstwhile Travancore Kingdom still escorts the idols during the procession, donning his traditional attire. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.